My name is Natalia, um, and this is the art of CSS, color theory deep dive. Um, and my Twitter's over there, so feel free to tweet at me. I won't respond in the next hour. Um, so here it is, the art of CSS. This talk that uh, is super vague sounding and super broad sounding, what could it possibly be? No, seriously, what are you expecting to see up here today? Uh, art is a really broad topic. Um, so is CSS. You could have a whole conference, and many people do, about just CSS. And then somewhere along the way in this hour, we're also going to have a deep dive into color theory. That's a lot. So let me tell you a little bit uh, about what I'm going to talk about. Um, but it starts with a story, and it starts with art being magic. Uh, I fell in love with art uh, when I was little because it actually seemed like actual magic. Um, and that's why I studied it. because. It, it can take an idea, and you can make somebody see it in a completely brand new way just with how you shape it. Uh, you can get somebody's gaze and draw them in to make them experience something. You can, you can master this like, visual language and be able to wield ideas. And it was just really, really cool. I, I loved studying art because there was always like a pattern to discover, some new understanding to reach, and, and just like some connection that could be made but it wasn't purely academic, because I could also feel the immense satisfaction of making something with my hands, or just making something and getting better and more proficient in a medium. So very much art equals magic. Um, and as an artist, I actually learned to talk about my work as if it was magic. Um, yes, you have to be brilliant, born with it, an amazing talent that none possess except for me, so that's why you have to pay me tons of money to um, access it. And uh, yeah, if I wrote this talk from the perspective of an artist, I would have probably come up here with a million showboating demos where um, I show you stuff that's impossible to do and completely impractical and showing off what, you know, what it's capable of and waited for my LinkedIn connections and my job offers to start rolling in. Um, I did not do that this talk. I approached it as a teacher and that means that the love that I have for this uh, for this domain and for this discipline, I would love to share it with you all. And I would like to share it in a way that's both practical and um, you can take your first steps on your own without me. And so that's a lot of what, what, what this talk is about as well, is just breaking things down into kind of meaningful chunks of information so that you can take it and start building your own understanding of what I'm even talking about. What is art? What is art of CSS? And what is color theory? So the last thing I want to do is something like this. Everyone's seen this meme, right? Like, super helpful tutorial, how to draw an owl, two steps. One, draw some circles, and then you're done, obviously. <sighs> this is just, again, <laughs> and I took out the curse word. Um, this is highlighting the fact that for any, anything, you have to break information down into meaningful steps. As a programmer, you have to write your first hello world before you can write a first application. And when you're studying design or art, for example, you have to uh, you know, draw some circles and a whole other lot of steps before you get to a full owl. So um, what this talk is, is again, intend to be practical so that you can actually apply this in your daily lives as either designers or programmers or whatever you're doing. Um, so you can take your first steps or second steps or build upon stuff you already know. And then um, one major thing I learned teaching is you can never get anybody to do a single thing unless you're able to answer the question of why. And that means, why is this important to me? Why should I care? Or like, what if I'm a programmer and I'm not a designer? I don't need this, but whatever. this. You know, I have coffee and I'm sitting in this chair or something like that. Like, I'm answering the question, why? Um, so hopefully at the end of this, if you get nothing else, it's the, the why of it all. Uh-oh, we get into this question a lot. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to sidestep this whole thing entirely. Um, I'm not here to say engineers should, should start learning design, and I'm not here to say that designers should uh, take time to think about code. Um, I'd like to pose an entirely different question. Um, <laughs> How about that line we keep drawing between the two? Uh, I crossed it at some point. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure 
where it was, where at some point I went from being an artist designer to being a software engineer, and uh, it sure feels really um, distinct in tech. It feels very real. I can't tell you where it is, but I feel like all of us in this room have felt it at some point where it's us and them, or it's, it's creative or not creative, it's, it's left brain, light, right brain, logic or creativity, and that just doesn't feel right to me because in my previous career, I was like a core part of my identity was being multidisciplinary and being able to jump from one kind of thinking to another and um, you know, being, being capable in many different ways of thought was a given. It was not the exception. I was not called a unicorn. Uh, but, but here it's somehow just like if you can do both technical and design things, you're a mythical creature. So my only thought on this really is just say this is not so binary and it shouldn't be so binary and we should work really hard to understand and respect uh, the different skill domains and expertise uh, when we're collaborating with each other. You know, there's a lot of different pieces that come together when, when we're working on a product. And um, I think we get in a lot of trouble when we decide, I don't need to know that, or I don't need to understand this, or especially when we start making decisions for people in, you know, whose expertise we're not even familiar with. So uh, no matter who you are, no matter what you're working on, Art is good to know. Um, knowledge is power, and no matter what, you, this is cool information. Um, unfortunately, learning art takes years, and we have less than an hour now. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you can go to art school, or you can go through this extremely fast-paced presentation with me. I don't think you have a choice. You're sitting in these chairs now. So, what did I teach all those years? Um, if I could tell you everything you need to know about art and design in one short conference talk, one, I would get a medal, um, and two, uh, I, I don't even know what I would be doing. So learning art is really um, how to see, think, and respond, and that is the artist's mental model. Right? It is not going through every object in every medium and drawing it one by one. And it's definitely uh, a whole lot more learning to apply patterns, knowledge, and understanding. So. That is why a painter can pick up a pencil and be pretty effective at you know, drawing that owl. Um, it's about applying your knowledge to a medium. So what is this mental model I just mentioned here, like a mental model, the artist's mental model? I have a lot to say on this topic. Um, in my intro class, just my intro class to design, I covered the following things. So if you never got a chance to go to art school, this is your moment. Uh, we were learning about line, a point set in motion, defining shape and form, line types, creating light and dark. Look at how much action is suddenly created by making those lines diagonal. I mean, we're talking about the web being boring because it's a bunch of blocks. Well, just make everything diagonal and suddenly you'll have a dynamic um, page. Don't tell your clients I said that. They'll all want diagonal clip paths, everything. Balance, for example. People want to see things be balanced. That's why when people are like, hmm, it looks off. You can see when things don't look balanced. So how to wield visual weight, texture with everything uh, in your composition. Proximity and things like how to create groups of elements and create visual relationships between different elements with shape and size and proximity. Um, unity and variety, for example, creating relationships between the groups of elements you've just created through uh, composition and through arrangement, again, shape, repetition, and again, uh, you can talk about space, positive and negative space, and how to use space effectively where things, like you don't just decide where things are, you also decide where things aren't, and Apple does this really, really well. All that white space we always talk about, uh, very intentional and very cool and very effective. And repetition, um, just repeating shapes has an effect, and, and it's a pretty powerful effect. And you can think about this like when you see a button that has rounded corners, and it's surrounded by buttons without rounded corners, and it just stands out, and it's terrible or great, depending on the, what the thing you intended to do with it. Um, emphasis, like for example, you're probably either looking at the different shape, like the circle, or the uh, magenta square there 
um, different ways to get people to look at something where, like, I can decide where I want you to look, and I know the different techniques to make you look there. Um, and of course, color. My favorite topic, and the thing that I'll be speaking about the most today, um, you know, the web didn't discover that if you put two complementary colors next to each other, you'll see that jiggle, visual jiggle, where things just kind of look funky. Um, it's been in textbooks for a really long time. And when we're learning about color, we're talking about, you know, the value scale, hue, saturation. We're talking about just like the perception, the, our perception, the, the little visible slice of the electromagnetic spectrum. And like, it's a studied, logical, and predictable thing, and we learn how to use it effectively, which again, more slides. Additive and subtractive color spaces, like how to use this to then create something with it. Um, also really, really cool. We study color palettes of like, for example, there's a classical palette of how, you know, if you go to a more classical museum, that's what you'll see. There's a lot of browns and yellows and the impressionist palette getting really colorful all of a sudden. And then there's our modern palette, which looks like what you'll be seeing later, a color wheel. But I'm talking about the artist's mental model here. I can't get too distracted with color. That's coming later. Uh, I also taught the design process. Like how do you get from you have a really good idea to, here it is, it's finished. Um, how to give and receive constructive criticism. Yet critiques are a really huge part of, of a, a design education. Um, usually you're working with something you're really invested in and you feel really strongly about, like this idea is, is you know, precious to me. And you, you show it to people and then they hate it. And how to handle that and how to actually use that as a growing opportunity to change it and to iterate. Speaking of iteration, uh, how to uh, move forward with an idea and, and make it better than it was before. How to wield form and function and balance the two. Divergent thinking, which is like brainstorming and coming up with as many possibilities po as possible. And then convergent thinking, which is coming back and culling those down into something that you actually want to elaborate on. The whole creative process. And of course, there in the corner, how to actually use the different kinds of media to express your ideas. So that's a lot. <sighs> that's a lot. And that's, again, just from my intro class. And if anybody was interested, like, where did all these charts come from? It's actually from a great book called Design Basics that I used with my students. So if anybody's ever interested in, like, I could read a textbook about design some weekend, um, I recommend it. But the point of this, and just showing you kind of like the peek under the hood of wh what it looks like to, to study design, is to get you to do a cognitive shift to separate the medium from the mental model. Uh, the medium is not the mental model. And, and that's something that we really know how to do already. That's why, you know, art is not painting, why programming is not coding. And, um, you know, again, mental model does not equal medium. Uh, we, we can respect the fact that a, a seasoned programmer can become efficient in a brand new programming language way more quickly than a complete beginner. And that because, that's because they're able to transfer their mental model to a new medium and express themselves in that medium. Um, you know, if a goal of a programmer is to automate some task that uh, a computer is capable of doing away from a human, um, whether they use JavaScript or PHP or, or something else that's a matter of preference or maybe like the project requires this or the project requires that. Um, the, the programming language they choose is just the medium to express these ideas and patterns and to get this job done. And really the same goes for designers. Whether you use Photoshop or Sketch, pen and paper, CSS, you know, HTML and CSS, those are the mediums you use uh, to, to express the ideas, the design principles that I just went through here. Um, that's precisely why we don't really, we kind of laugh at job postings when they're like, I, I don't think I've ever seen a job posting for like, we need a sketch designer, not a Photoshop designer, because those are completely different and you cannot switch between the two. Um, it's, it, we know how to make this switch from the, for the mental model. So um, just keep that in mind when we're talking about CSS and the art of CSS, because I think that CSS and the platform of the web, they're a medium for expressing design principles. Um, artists and designers are working on the web today and they use CSS to express their mental models. I know I do. 
Um, CSS is uh, a creative tool. It's not bad programming. <laughs> Uh, CSS isn't always seen as a respected medium, right? How many times have you seen it referred to as just like really just like this is just not real development, it's bad programming. Ugh. I think it gets lumped in with coding or like JavaScript, PHP, or Ruby because it's also like this is code on a text document and um, they look so visually similar. And that's really common and that's not surprising at all. And I'm not here to argue or try to like, like yeah, rally and cry. Um, please stop doing that. Um, this, this kind of misunderstanding and assumption always happened in the classroom for me. Um, it's how we learn. We, we try to understand something new based on what we already know. So by engaging our prior knowledge, we're liable to make some kind of incorrect assumptions about something if it's actually something completely different. Uh, so it's not surprising that those familiar with programming principles um, will likely bring a lot of those assumptions into working with CSS, right? So all of a sudden, when CSS doesn't behave the way that they expect it to, ah, it's broken and um, it doesn't match their mental model and uh, oh no, we get here. <sighs> It's a lot of results. This makes me so sad. I didn't even have to type the whole thing. Google finished it for me. You know what happens when you search for CSS is awesome? <laughs> Not as many. And you know what? I think everybody's actually just searching for that damn mug. <laughs> Which, again, I love using this as an example because where someone sees a bug coming from their mental model, I see a feature. Hey, thanks CSS, you're leaving up, uh, leaving how to handle overflow to me. I have got so many options. Do I clip the text or, or maybe do an, you know, ellipsis or something or maybe I hyphenate? I don't know, the, the opportunities are endless. Um, I mean it literally, says you can think outside of the box. <laughs> and yet this is, this is like given as a gag gift to people who have to hack together some CSS every once in a while. And um, I don't know how I feel about the fact that I still want this mug myself. <laughs> no one's gotten it for me yet, I don't know. Um, so, you know, let, let's, let's backtrack a little bit. CSS is actually magic in the same way art felt like magic. Um, for me personally, the transition coming from design and art, the transition to learning CSS was seamless. As soon as I found this, I was like, yes, this is smooth. This is not at all what everybody said it was going to be. Um, it was seamless, it was intuitive, and the very things that all these programmers were grumbling about with CSS were like, hey, this is empowering and it allows me to express my mental model exactly the way I want to. Um, yep, I am exactly talking about the global scope, the cascade, lack of name spacing, I could go on and on, um, and including the separation of styles away from behavior. It's a big one. Um, so those are awesome, and those are like the biggest strengths of CSS, because again, they allow me to take my understanding and the depths of my understanding and put it on the web. They allow me to be a designer, an artist on the web. Um, so personally, no. I've never thought CSS was broken. I've always seen it as this is awesome and this is magic. Um, yes, I've seen features that I was like, I would like for CSS to have these and it's totally going to soon. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. And I've also seen a lot of really bad code written with CSS um, and then CSS taking the blame for it. Um, and again, I say this, not as someone who's just like, I'm staying in CSS land I'm, I'm gonna only work with CSS. Um, I actually was very curious about all of the changes that are happening in this ecosystem. And my day job involves working in React with CSS modules. Like I'm, I'm trying it all out and seeing where this is going. So um, I speak from experience and from kind of, uh, I'm trying all the different things and I'm telling you what works, 
and works for me. So here's how I feel. <laughs> uh, I am confronted, confronted with these statements like, it should be replaced, it's terrible, get it out of there and put it in JavaScript. Or um, like, what chaos, it's, it's a nightmare. Um, and I have a theory about that. I think, I think it's because um, CSS kind of appears on just about every developer's resume, no matter how much or how little they've had to write it. Which again, I'm not saying take it off your resume or stop having people endorse you on LinkedIn for CSS. I'm just saying like when a project starts out, the first person hired is usually a really generalist developer who can get it working and who can probably get it styled close enough. Um, and you know, like they're responsible for absolutely everything on a project. That's no, <laughs> that's, that's like not a small deal. And so yeah, writing a great um, system to support design patterns is not usually the priority. It's just getting it loading, getting it working, getting it to an MVP that you can keep going to the next step. Um, so if you're the only person working on something and you've got to write the worst CSS and like put importance on everything, do what you have to do to get the job done. But don't be surprised when you hire your front end developer or somebody who's more experienced with CSS, when they want to change the system that you've set up because what matches your mental model does not match theirs. The things you've done to tame the chaos of CSS is actually uh, constricting your front end developer's ability to work uh, to their full potential. So um, that's I think where a lot of the friction between design and development starts is when um, we're just working with different mental models and we're not always able to see things from each other's perspectives. Um, it is so much more easy to say, well that's dumb, than to say, you know, I don't think I really fully understand what's going on here. But um, if we took the latter approach, I think would, things would be a lot easier and you'd be able to have the kind of love for CSS that I do. Because <sighs> I dropped these things, I said, yeah, the cascade, global scope, namespacing, uh, those are great things. Uh, and I'm gonna stand by that. Um, I think in layers. That's how I was trained as an artist, to think in layers. And uh, the first thing you learn when you're learning any kind of composition making in art is don't ever work on it piece by piece. That's a guaranteed way to have an ununified whole. Like you're just gonna have a bunch of stuff that doesn't work together. And you may never actually finish your painting. The idea here is you work layer by layer, starting with the broadest strokes, and, and refining it as you go on, layer by layer. If you look at any art museum, most oil paintings are a combination of many layers all working together to create a beautiful composition. So for me, the cascade is absolutely intuitive and it makes, makes it possible for me to um, create patterns at the levels of abstraction that make sense to me. Um, it, it, you know, if, if, like, if you have piece by piece components that redeclare color, line height, uh, font, padding, everything. Um, that segments things out in such a way that I feel like I'm working in a little kid's coloring book where like the lines have been drawn for me and I can't, I can't color outside of the lines. Um, so the cascade feels like creative freedom to me. <sighs> Globals. Globals. Uh, yeah, they can be a hindrance. It's like that with great power comes great responsibility. Um, but it's also one of those powerful tools in CSS. Um, again, I'm trained to look at the big picture all the time. Look like back out, zoom out, look at the big picture. And I'm trying to make sure that all of the parts combined into a uniform, uniform whole. Um, global scope is actually how I'm able like, to work uh, with color and color theory and keep the relationships between things. Like if you, um, if you break my ability to, to do a global scope, then you break my ability to theme. You break my ability to create patterns in the way that I need to. Um, if nothing is clashing, cool, but nothing's interacting either. Uh, so, you know, I'm trying to create meaningful, meaningful relationships between design patterns and uh, I know how to do that with a global scope. Also, no namespacing. Um, like, it's just not that big of a problem. <laughs> I don't know how to say that in a more kind of like, it's not a big deal. Um, 
I, what I'm saying is I really need the ability to write context-specific styles. You can't just like come up with the one perfect component, one perfect thing, and have it used perfectly everywhere because it's just not how it works. You will have different contexts for different things, and you'll have to modify those different things. And there's just always complexity that, that gets introduced into a design and in a project. There's always complexity. Um, Context-specific styling, I think, is my biggest kind of like, we need the freedom and ability that CSS gives us to, to, to work with that. Uh, because here, let's check it out, if you don't believe me. What's the difference between the heart on the gray square and the heart on the white square? Anybody? Raise your hand. What's the difference between the heart on the gray square and the heart on the white square? What? Nothing. Yeah, there's no difference. I mean, like, they're two hearts. Uh, I'm actually, this is a trick question. Both hearts are on the same shade of gray. Seven, nine, seven, nine, seven, nine over there. Um, you can see it right here. Your brain doesn't let you accept that, does it? You're looking at it. I'm not lying. Yeah, context matters. Not, not because of computers and like, we're not writing styles just for these perfect little computer pieces and we can just have these components and put them wherever. Um, we are working uh, <laughs> with legacy systems our brains and eyeballs, and we have to support those. We don't get an option. Um, no matter what kind of website, whatever app you're working on, the people looking at it, their eyes and their, and their brains are still trying to figure out. So I'm looking at this like, where am I? Are there any predators around? And is there any food to eat? And that process is always permanently running through your mind. So you get all sorts of weird Legacy quirks, like for example, you know, I can't get over this illusion here. I mean, you can't, un you can't see it on purpose. So uh, legacy eyeballs is probably also why you have like 50 shades of gray in your project and why your designers are like, I need a different gray, I need another gray, I need another gray. You don't understand. Um, maybe this will help a little bit. Uh, Again, like you're not writing these styles for a computer read and perfect little packages and perfect little components. You're always working with the complexity of the human mind and the human eyes, uh, or in human eyes. So CSS gives us patterns that you can create to support this complexity. So CSS isn't the complexity, we're the complexity. Um, and CSS supports that. And my favorite pattern, of course, now we're here at the color theory side of things, is color. Um, that's, I could talk all day about color. Color theory is like a complex pattern of relationships that influence us greatly. Color is so powerful. Color on the web is essentially a coloring book, and I mean it <laughs> very directly. Even with SAS, even with your color partial, even whatever you do there, um, you basically just come up with a color palette and you just fill it in per component, per element, and you call it a day. You draw a shape, you fill it in with a color, and you're like, yes, this is my web. That's what it feels like to me. This is from the McGruff Internet Safety <laughs> Coloring Book, which is a, a thrill ride in its own. I lost a lot of time just looking through it. Uh, you know, if you're just trying to add color to every component, um, or just like maybe you start with a unified color palette and you start adding it to different things, like you're still gonna lose the ability to code color relationships. Like, what if instead of unconnected color swatches, your entire application kept the logic and kept the pattern uh, and the, the relationships between colors preserved? Like, what if those color schemes and relationships remained intact? So what do I mean by that? If you're still like, what relationships between what colors? Hmm, it's my favorite. I changed it from last year, so somebody tell me what. <laughs> What's the relationship between uh, 47B4EB and EB7E47? Obvious, right? Oh, I see you hand gesturing. You're totally right. Yes. There's always one person, who, one poor soul who's learned how to read hex. Um, sorry about that. But again, I'm not making fun of the web. Like, oh, look at the web using colors. We artists have figured it out a long time ago. 
Uh, bad name conventions have existed in the fine art world for a long time. We have things like thalocyanide blue, obvious what kind of blue it is, dioxazine mauve, ultramarine red pink, and my favorite, ivory black. Is it black or is it ivory? Find out. Um, and then, you know, on the web, we have a whole lot of different ways people use color. I like to use papaya whip, thistle, and goldenrod. I also like RGB 266, 18860, uh, and 87D2E5. Yeah, from, uh, from, <laughs> from everybody's faces, like, what? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to make a point that there's a better way that we can use color that's more human readable and intuitive. And in fact, that's what um, HSL is. It's, it's a tool to, to basically work with color on a web in, a, in the way that allows you to start internalizing the artist's mental model of how color works. So it's not just like, oh, HSL is superior. I mean it, it's like a great tool that as you use HSL, you will start to be able to use color more int intuitively and understand how it actually interacts with other colors. So um, that's, that's kind of uh, the first of the core understandings to use color with intent. Um, I'm going to be covering a couple of different kind of principles that are all going to combine that you can build on. And the first is, like I said, HSL. Um, who here has ever used HSL to declare colors? Awesome. I love that. Every year is more. Um, who here has had a color wheel hanging up in some classroom at some point in their lives? Color wheel? Yeah, so let me, let me just backtrack here. The color wheel um, is this circle on which you see your colors. And the HSL uh, in the middle there is like, yeah, and on the web, that's represented by 0 to 360, and each angle corresponds to a, a uh, hue. Um, and it's, I'll explain later why it's a color wheel and not a color line. But HSL essentially stands for hue, saturation, and lightness. So for example, when I say hue, I just mean color. Like, what color is it? The hue is red. Um, saturation, how intense is that color? So zero would just be like, it's just gray. There's, you couldn't tell it's red, even if you tried. 100% is the most red, like the most saturated red. Uh, and lightness is like, pretty obvious. How light or dark is it? 20% will give you more of like a burgundy. 80% um, a nice coral pink. So that's a, a simplified version of it, but it, these are some of the words that I'm going to be using. And then demo time. Let me command shift F and C. Um, so I'm always obsessed with trying to figure out how to build learning tools for people. Um, if anyone's done West Boss's JavaScript 30, really fun project starters, and you can do whatever you want with them. Uh, and so he had this one where it was like, build a clock. And uh, so this is still a clock. This is what time it is. And uh, you, you can see that it also is an HSL clock. And as the seconds tick by, they change the hue as they go down this angle. So the point of this is if you can learn to read an analog clock, which hopefully everybody in here can, otherwise this is a learning tool again. Uh, if you can learn to read an analog clock, you can absolutely just start using HSL today. Uh, there it is. It's about to get to uh, zero, which is red or 360. You know, it just keeps on going. Um, and uh, yeah, look at it go. Uh, then, so you can see there's a little explanation there if you missed what I said. And then there's the value scales to, I kind of want to explain lightness, right? Like, what am I talking about the L in HSL lightness? Well, this is uh, just editing the L in HSL. I set the hue to zero, so it's red, where we left off. And then the saturation to zero. So once again, saturation at zero means that you can't even tell it's red. It's just gray, shades of gray. And then each block, I increment the lightness up by 10. So it moves from a low key from black to high key white. And you know, you've got contrast there. If you just decide to do a website like this without any color information in black and white, cool, great. I mean, it would be really minimal and cool and sleek, um, but it would work. You would have, you would have the ability to immediately tell, do I have enough contrast? Can people tell what they're looking at? And the answer is yes. So let's, let's add a little bit of complexity to it and just introduce saturation. So this is the same exact lightness scale. All I did was in HSL, I changed the saturation from zero to 100%. So it's 
So now uh, that is 100% red, and the only thing we're changing is the, uh, the lightness again. So this is red at zero lightness, and then in the middle it's a 50% lightness, and on the right over there, it's 100% lightness. So it's essentially 100% white again. It's FFF, if anybody's still hoping for hex here. Um, and, and it's important to note that the very middle in there, the, the red right here, that's the truest red. Um, if you want to pick the color that's the outside of the color wheel, the, the most pure color, that if you inspect element on this, it'll just say red. Uh, all you have to do is pick the correct hue, so zero, that's for red at 100% saturation and at 50% lightness. And that's the base of your mixing colors. That's the reddest red you can have. And so you can, you can basically work from there. But here's where we get in trouble and where I think color really trips people up. Because this seems really simple. Like, yeah, OK, cool. Lightness, saturation, got it. Um, you know all that disagreement about contrast and brightness? And you're like, how do I tell what a bright color is? How do we even know? Like, what? Why is someone telling me my website is terrible because these look pretty different to me? What, what's going on here? Look at when we introduce hue and we just rotate the hue as well. Um, so again, this is the same thing happening here, right? The saturation stays at 100%. My lightness is incrementing by 10%. So nothing's changed. The only difference is here is we've just also said, yeah, each, um, each block change, uh, change the hue by about 30, 30%, 30 degrees. So start rotating through the color wheel. It's a lot harder to tell which color is uh, brighter, and like all of a sudden, color information starts to to get us confused, and we're like, I don't know how to pick a color palette that's going to work. Uh, I'm going to let somebody else do this. This is not not going to work for me. Um, but at the same time, you can create all these colors with HSL and start just playing around and seeing what the different values are, and making sure you can pay attention to the the saturation, the lightness, and the hue, and you you can start mix. I guess manually mixing these colors yourself, which you can't really do with um, hex or RGB. You have to do too, much, too many steps and too much math to try to do that. Here it's just it's basically 360 degrees, 100%, 100%, and then figure out your ratios from there. Um, but what I'm really trying to show you is like, really you've got your value scale, you figure out some contrast, you figure out which hue you want to work with, and then you're like, well, there's some highlights, midtones, and shadows, right? Like the highlight mid-tone, shadow, uh, what can I use those for? Like, I've got the ability to make these, cool, what for? Um, this is, you can just start creating shape with it. It's really that simple. Highlights, mid-tones, and shadows combined <laughs> create the illusion of shape, and it doesn't even matter what color you're in. You just, it starts looking like a, a more 3D object because, again, our brains are trying to figure out where are we, where's the sun coming from, and uh, where's the shadow? Okay, I think I understand how this shape works. So you've got your highlights, your midtones, and your shadow, you know, kind of working, working for you. And all of a sudden, you, you feel a little more grounded, and things start to make um, a little bit more sense. And so, again, this is a really, really simplified example. It's like, well, what, how can I use this on a project? Um, how does this, how does this work for when I'm working on an app on the web, and I don't need to make weird gem shapes of, out of anything? Um, well, a little while ago I made a demo of just like a themed website, like, hey, I am going to create uh, a sample of what it looks like to, um, you know, I never like getting stuck with one color scheme, and I love changing colors a whole lot. And so I wanted to see, is it possible to create a complementary color scheme for a website where um, all I have to do is just change one variable and the rest of the site adapts. I don't want to make a million different style sheets with a million different designs. Uh, I just want the color relationships to stay completely preserved and intact. And so this is what this is. Um, you'll see this site, and I've got, you know, pick your different call to action color. So, you know, it will retheme itself uh, depending on where you are. Um, but the only thing that's really changing is one variable, the call to action color. And that variable just gets fed through a bunch of different functions that take into account the different properties of color. And they give you just one example of uh, a complementary color scheme. And I'll show you how that works. Um, you can skip this. You have no choice but to listen to me. Uh, and if you are completely lost, feel free to get on your phone and check out the prerequisites, like uh, 
what HSL is. You can review that. There's some good color functions we'll be using. And if you're if you've never used SAS, um, you know you could check out that as well. So the idea here is again, here's our color wheel. A complementary color scheme is from one side to the other side of the color wheel. It means they're opposites. That's why it's not a color line. A complementary color is 180 degrees away from its complement, or the color is 180 degrees away from its complement. So you've got your HSL here, you know, values you can go through. So you can just pick a color, any color. Remember I told you about the purest color you can pick, the, the greenest green, for example? Again, uh, you, you set your hue, saturation 100%, lightness 50. That'll give you the most chromatic color you can get. And then you don't even have to count or do math. You can just say, hey, uh, I want my complementary color complement. SAS has that function. It's really convenient. I don't have to do math like 180, uh, adjust hue 180. Um, and this is what happens if you theme your entire website with complementary colors. This is why we have designers. <laughs> like, <laughs> this, this, this is terrible. I feel like I can play like start game and it'll just have like three pixels for me to play with. Uh, it doesn't look great. It's kind of tough. Um, so I've got a couple of different functions that I kind of go through and I can get into more detail with those. But you can do a lot with functions that SAS has right now, like mixing colors. You can say, give me some of that green and throw some purple in it, and give me some of that purple and throw some green in it, and it will calculate those for you. So this is what happens when you mix some of these colors together, and suddenly it doesn't look as bad, but it still looks pretty bad. But, but it kind of looks like these colors go together a little bit more. Let's keep going, keep making it better. There's no place to stop. Um, you can create those neutrals, so they can remember you can like, look at that boring purples, mauves really, that come out of uh, that really neon looking purple. Um, that you can, you know, mix neutral, I made a little function, but you can just do it with like lighten and darkness, darken, or you can just mess with the lightness. It's really, like there's a lot of wiggle room. You don't have to be perfect with it. But if you have a lighter version and a darker version, you can create the illusion of shape. And you can start kind of chilling things out on the web. Um, one of the things I always taught in my art classes is like, you know, everybody gets really excited about all those cool paint tubes that you have in the art store. You know, they've got all these beautiful colors. And, and when you start painting, you start filling up your canvas with just the prettiest, the most beautiful blue, the most awesome green. And then by the time you're finished, you're like, this looks like a giant mess. Um, that's because our eyes are not meant to handle such intense colors. Like the colors that a computer screen can shine at your eyes are not the colors your brain wants to see or can handle seeing. You can make somebody really uh, nauseous with those. So getting, you know, having the restraint to use more neutral colors is actually a really, really good thing. Uh, that's how you get things to pop or not pop is by being able to just like tone it down a ton. Look at that. A lot more chill getting there. Uh, but still looks terrible. <laughs> Nobody's going to want to, ugh, green and purple. Uh, you can desaturate, you know, mix neutrals, desaturate, very similar. I'm going to skip that. Get, a, get some contrast in there. You know how to mix a white and a black with the lightness and the darkness. And then basically here's your call to action, your little menu. You're, making, you're doing emphasis with color so you can guide people's eyes through the navigation. Um, and there we go. Any, any site you have essentially looks like this, which is not really particularly exciting. I made a boring example on purpose. Is that uh, There's just patterns you can use that will work. There are color rules you can follow, and that as long as you stay within s certain principles, you're going to have something that works for most people. Or you know, and uh, I'm going to skip this part over here real quick. Here's the here's a picture of what I actually did. This is the decision tree that I just showed you. Ah, thanks responsiveness. Um, <laughs> yeah, never said that. <laughs> I was like, yay. <laughs> uh, so basically, what it's saying is like, I'm not just going to a color picker and just picking colors at random until I feel that they work together somehow with my intuition as an artist. Uh, I'm saying I'm literally applying my mental model of how colors mix, uh, the way that I learned to mix with paint, onto the web. And like right now with the SAS functions, they allow me to do that. Uh, I take some green, I generate a complementary color, which is that purple, and then uh, I add some of that to the green which chills the green out a little bit. And then I just keep mixing from the same kind of bunch of colors. Like I can lighten, I can darken, 
I can use that, that uh, highlight over there and mix it back in again. And just at the end of it, you, you get this little palette that ends up working together. And as long as you have enough contrast between things that are, that are adjacent to each other, you're going to be able to define something that looks like a distinct shape. And that's really as magical and exciting as it is, which again, um, these are patterns that anybody can learn. Uh, and it's not something that is reserved for unicorns. But it would be cool if unicorns could, I don't know, there's something there. So <laughs> what I'm trying to show is like there's, as long as you stay within the patterns and, and you kind of get kind of actually just a little bit uh, of under understanding about how color, like the different parts of color, not just the hue, but also the saturation and the lightness and how those interact, you can become pretty quickly effective in, in, in being able to uh, experiment on your own. And so here's, here's an example of a, a terrible piece of UI. Never do this. This is a button. <laughs> um, sometimes you don't ask yourself if you should, but if you could. And uh, so what I did, has anyone ever seen the Vincent van Gogh Almond Blossoms painting? I'm going to Google this. Nah, I'm just kidding. Vincent van Gogh's Almond Blossoms painting is a big painting of a tree. It's really cool. And so I wanted to see if I could recreate it with SVG. <laughs> just this, like, this is markup and styles. And so here it's purple. It's not supposed to be purple. Let's do the original. Yeah, there we go. Close enough to the original. And this is just like, you know, SVGs in terribly unoptimized <laughs> ways. And I've got party mode here. If you are sensitive to motion, look to the back of this theater, please. Uh, because this is party mode. And this is just showing, like, if you just start going nuts with color, but you stick to highlights, midtones, and shadows, keep enough of your canvas a neutral color, that's just going to work. Like, it doesn't even matter what color stuff is. It's just kind of going to work. Uh, color's a lot more forgiving and <laughs> fluid here, because um, you know, putting an outline on something when in doubt, it's great. It removes that jiggle. Uh, so, wow, it's a really ugly color. There we go. Uh, it's just going to work. And it's not going to, uh, it's not like this life or death question of like, can I pick these colors? What happens if I pick a wrong color? I mean, it's a pretty vulnerable thing to work with color, but uh, you've got these patterns supporting you all the time. So I'm just going to turn that off. Actually, my favorite thing is when this got posted online somewhere, somebody was like, does she even know SVG stands for like scalable vector graphics? Because I made the joke it was a scalable Van Gogh. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> there's a whole discussion thread about it. Like, could she possibly be making a joke? <laughs> I saved that screenshot forever, and it's on my fridge. Uh, so back to my Google Slides here. Um, I, I know this is a little bit broad in many topics, but because this is a really broad topic. Uh, but I want to um, make sure to mention this right here. Uh, I couldn't have done any of what I've done without the amazing CSS community surrounding CSS. Uh, there are artists and designers working on amazing things, making amazing things happen with this medium. Um, like, for example, uh, <laughs> For, for layout, uh, Jen Simmons, uh, and well, she's, she's in New York, so I go to her meetup all the time. And Rachel Andrews, like, amazing things, artistic things happening. There's like SAS patterns, like Miriam Suzanne's just been making cool stuff forever. Animations, I've been so inspired by Rachel Neighbors and Sarah Drasner. Um, Mike rismiller has been doing cool stuff with responsive typography, and I could go on and on and on. There are experts working at the top of this field. And they're using this medium to express amazing things. Uh, and check them out. See what professionals are doing with this medium and what they're, like, where they're taking it. Because when you really think about it, uh, we give painting a pass. Right? Painting is obviously artistic. Painting is this totally artsy thing. And we've just like, accepted that that's, that's a fine medium. Yeah, that's what you make art with, painting. But when you really break it down, it is a stick. And you've got some boar hair attached to the end of that stick. And we're like, yeah, we're going to crush up some rocks, add some, some stuff to it, and we're going to paint on this fabric until it looks like a mountain with happy little trees. If you just judge the medium and say that's broken, and you don't see the amazing things that we fill museums up with when we give people this freedom to work in a medium and, and discover it and grow it and, 
and become better with it, um, you, you'll just miss out on a lot. So CSS is really awesome. It is growing, it is evolving, and it is, um, it is a tool that works for a whole lot of people to work at the top of their game. Uh, if, you want, if you want your project to look amazing, get somebody and give them the tool uh, that, that they feel comfortable working with, that where they feel like their hands aren't bound or things aren't happening to limit their ability to express their mental model with it. Um, it may not be intuitive for absolutely everybody, but it is a really powerful tool that when given to somebody who understands the, the mental model of how it works, how to apply their, their understandings to it, um, you're gonna be able to see some amazing things happening. So, uh, any questions? Because thank you. <laughs>